It's a turbocharged crossover for the street. Is it groundbreaking or backbreaking? That's coming up right now on Driving Sports TV. If you haven't yet subscribed, please take a moment to do that right now. We're looking to surpass 100,000 subscribers this year. And to make that happen, we're going to need your help. Now, on with the review. Mazda is well known for building affordable cars that are also fun to drive. Case in point, the Mazda Miata, the Mazda 3, and pretty much anything else they're currently building. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that the newest version of the CX-5 compact crossover isn't just a mild refresh, but instead it now comes with an available turbocharged engine, a top level signature trim and all wheel drive. Prices you see it here with pretty much all the options, including a paint upgrade to Soul Red, their signature color, $39,325, including destination. Under the hood is Mazda's new 2.5 liter turbocharged four cylinder. This particular engine is only available on the premium touring reserve and signature trim levels. This mill puts out either 227 or 250 horsepower, depending on if it was filled with regular or premium fuel. Either way, you get a whopping 310 pound-feet of torque. Turbo lag isn't a problem anymore because Mazda has engineered a way to increase the flow of air to the turbo at idle, essentially taking lag out of the equation. You can think of it like putting your finger over a garden hose. Same volume of liquid, but restrict the flow and it increases the velocity same thing. The engine is connected to only one transmission option, a six-speed automatic with manual and sport modes. You can get the CX-5 in either front or all-wheel drive, but if you want this turbo, you can only get that with all-wheel drive like we have it here. But more on that later. This particular setup is rated at 22 miles to the gallon city and 27 on the highway by the EPA. Inside is Mazda's top end trim similar to the Mazda 6 Signature Edition we reviewed last year. The wood inlays are actual wood, and all the vents are surrounded by nice metals. Mazda is, however, stubbornly sticking to piano black in places where it's guaranteed to get hella scratched, which isn't so great. The optional Nappa leather on the wheel, shifter, and seat all feel fantastic to the touch. But at nearly $40,000 for a compact crossover, you could expect that the interior should be better than average. And it is. The rear cargo area is small for the class, just 30.9 cubic feet with the second row up. Fold it down with the handy pull levers, and you're looking at 59.6 cubic feet in total. Compare that to the Honda CRV with its 75.8 cubic feet, and you can see the CX-5 just isn't the best choice if you need to haul a lot of stuff on a regular basis. The second row does seat a full-size adult with ease. You also get seat heaters back there. The controls are hidden under the flip-down armrest, along with a bonus USB connection for charging devices. Upfront drivers get near-luxury appointments. The black and brown color scheme is pretty classy. The driver's seat also gets eight-way power adjustments with memory. But none of these settings make the seats any softer. Seriously, these are the hardest seats I've sat in this year. Mazda's head unit finally includes Apple CarPlay and Android Auto from the factory. When parked, you can use it like a touchscreen. However, once moving, they lock that functionality out due to safety concerns and make you control everything with the control knob in the center. Navigation and XM satellite capability is included, though I honestly just use Apple Maps on CarPlay these days, so your own mileage may vary. Other vehicles in this class are starting to offer 8-inch screens, so Mazda's premium 7-inch offering does look small compared to the competition. There is one more switch down on the center console, and that is the SPORT button. It basically just instructs the transmission to shift at a higher RPM. Nothing really fancy. I kind of do like that they didn't bother to retard the throttle with a useless eco mode like everyone else, so kudos to Mazda for that. The CX-5 comes with a lot of available active safety features, as one would expect today. Blind spot warnings, radar-based cruise control with lane detection, traffic sign recognition, a laser-based auto braking system, eh? rear cross-traffic alerts, a heads-up display, and surround-view camera system with parking sonars. 
let me take a moment to briefly address the state of the crossover market and where this CX-5 fits in. For a while, all crossovers were shockingly similar. Basically, a raised car with soft suspension and a wagon back. The first CX-5 fits this mold pretty good. As Americans move away from sedans as their preferred automotive option and into crossovers, we're starting to see the crossover market explode. And as a result, this segment is starting to split into two very different vehicles. On one side, you have vehicles that are gaining capability and comfort. They're like little forerunners. In this camp, I'd place the new RAV4 Adventure and both Subaru's Crosstrek and Forester. Vehicles in this category have terrain-selectable all-wheel drive programs and above-average ground clearance. Let's call them soft crossers. On the other side are what I would consider to be more directly car replacements. These are street-going crossovers that make no pretense of off-road capability. Their all-wheel drive systems are tuned for paved surfaces. Ground clearance is a secondary concern, and in some cases, they're actually pretty quick. Three, two, one, go! 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60. But like a crossover, the seating position is higher than a car, and you get bonus cargo space in the back. This second category includes vehicles like the Ford Edge ST, Acura RDX, and this, the Mazda CX-5. I'd call these ones car crossers, or if they're quick enough, you could even call them hot crossers. For proof of the carification of crossovers, look no further than the 2020 Ford Escape. That doesn't even try to look like a crossover. Instead, they're expecting to release a baby Bronco to take on the RAV4 Adventure and the Jeep Renegades of the world. The mainstream one is just designed to replace cars. Why do I explain this? One. I think it's interesting. But also, as the market matures, we're seeing car makers take some real chances as they push their vehicles to one category or the other. This CX-5 is one of those vehicles. It takes the crossover formula and really pushes the street-focused performance envelope, totally ignoring any pretense of off-road ability. Because of this, it has more in common with a street-ready hatchback than it does with a Subaru Forester. And honestly, you're really not going to want to go over anything other than a smooth gravel road with 225-55R19s. Yes, this has 19-inch wheels on it. But that said, I was curious about the basic functionality of the all-wheel drive setup in the CX-5. So that leads me to the slip test. Here I am on a slippery surface, and I'm simply going to punch the throttle. Does the CX-5 detect slip and push power to the back, or will it just spin the front wheels? Well, I think that looks pretty conclusive. It is a front wheel spinner. Now, same thing again, this time with traction control off. And three, two, one, go. Ah, oh, front wheel spin city. On Subaru, Hondas with IVTM4, Acuras with SH all-wheel drive, and even Mercedes' 4Matic system, we've seen both wheels launch a car on slippery surfaces, all four wheels doing their part. But not here. This tells me one thing. This is a low-speed, safety-oriented all-wheel drive setup. Open differentials all around, and a small, light center clutch with limited ability to hold torque to the back. These systems lack capability, but they are light so they do have that going for them. You know, the suspension is a little stiff even for a gravel road like this. This is not something that you're going to take off-roading. It's just not. I mean, granted, yeah, you could go up to like trailhead roads and that kind of stuff, but you're not going to do anything more severe, definitely. Let's go ahead and hit the power. Every launch in this vehicle feels like a front wheel drive car, along with the modest amount of torque steer you would expect. Wow, it really feels like a front-wheel drive car when I'm moshing the throttle. Body roll is well controlled. Brakes are pretty good. This car has a lot of power, and it comes on fast. That has to go somewhere. And in this case, it's directly to the front wheels in most conditions. Now let's see a 0-60 to 60 run. I'm putting in sport mode, even though wide open throttle will override that anyway, so it doesn't matter. Going to preload brakes. Three, two, one, and go. Oh, it's like kind of like launch control. Chirp the front wheels. 40, 
50 and 60. That's really, really quite quick actually uh, for a vehicle in this class. Ah oh, man, feeling that front wheel drive, even though it's all wheel drive. Okay, shift, shift. Oh yeah, that's pretty quick. Man, there's like, the body roll is really well controlled. Overall composure of the vehicle through the corners, excellent. Once you get to speed, the CX-5 really corners surprisingly well. This is in part to some magic that Mazda calls their vehicle dynamics with G-Vector Control Plus system. So you're probably asking, what the heck is that? I'll explain. It simulates what racers do when they enter a corner, shift weight to the front wheels so the tires can do their job more effectively. It's subtle, but it makes a big difference in cornering ability. In the CX-5, the vehicle monitors speed, throttle position, and steering angle. When it detects a corner is about to happen, it retards spark timing, which reduces power just slightly enough to increase front tire load. The result is a more neutral handling vehicle with everything under the surface happening instantly and automatically. Any steering input, we're looking at the, the steering uh, wheel velocity and, and the, the steering, uh, electric power steering system reads uh, a tenth of a degree of steering input. Yep. So it can, it can respond to that small uh, of a steering input and uh, the amount of torque reduction that it does to, to shift weight is proportional to your steering speed and your vehicle speed and, and how much throttle you have. But the absolute most G reduction that it can do is uh, uh, 0.05 G, which is less than you can feel. You just think you're a better driver than you are. That's not bad, right? So far as I know, nobody else does this. It's unique and it's pretty awesome. However, it's also really only useful on paved surfaces. This isn't a crossover made for dirt. The suspension is simply too stiff. The wheels are too big. The ground clearance isn't high enough. And that brings me back to what this car is and who it's good for. If you want the best handling, most fun to drive crossover south of a Lamborghini Urus, the new CX-5 Turbo all-wheel drive is the car of your dreams. However, you are making some significant sacrifices if you go this direction. The seats, yeah, they're not great. The all-wheel drive system is pretty limited. It has a fairly small amount of cargo capacity and it is kind of expensive for the class. If you can live with those caveats, you will simply love the CX-5. If, on the other hand, you think you need some off-road capability and you honestly want more comfort and cargo capacity, then consider the Subaru or the RAV4 Adventure or one of the many other options. Not sure what you want? Yeah, just get a Honda CRV. You'll be fine. Do you consider yourself a soft crosser, a car crosser, or a hot crosser? Post a comment below. Also, please give us a like and share this video. We're on our way to 100,000 subscribers and we need your help to get there. For Driving Sports TV, I'm Ryan Douthit. Thanks for watching. Speaking of hot crossers, Easter's coming up. Let's get some hot cross buns. We'll see you next week.